Hello, welcome to my channel. The book I'm sharing today is Sonic Boom, subtitled How Sound Transforms the Way We Think, Feel, and Buy. The word Sonic Boom, itself, refers to the loud sound made by an object moving at extreme speed, producing a shock wave. This loud sound is so energetic that it sounds like an explosion. We live in a dazzling world of senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell and taste are constantly competing for our attention. Too much information doesn't really work better. For visual design, the most important thing is to be eye-catching, and from auditory design, the key is to create a moment of sonic boom. The author of this book, Joel Beckman, is a man who continues to bring sonic boom moments to the world. He is a composer and television producer who has composed the soundtracks for more than 50 television shows. In 1998, he founded a music company called Artificial Music. This company is filled with songwriters, writers, producers, brand planners, user experience designers and more. These people come together to use the power of sound to tell unique stories for commercial brands. Beckman and his company have developed unique sound brands for many global business giants, including Disney, Mercedes-Benz, AT&T, and domestic Southwest Airlines. In this book, he cites many interesting examples from the business and entertainment industries of how professionals have turned sound into a strategy to add a finishing touch to a product, and how sound has been used to tell just the right brand story to bring unexpected benefits to a brand. Let's look at two examples. Just the right sound, supermarket and restaurant background music. Sound is everywhere, and it can influence human behavior in many ways. Back in the 1980s, renowned marketing professor Ronald Millman found that supermarket sales were 38% higher when slow tempo music was played than when fast tempo music was played. When hearing fast paced music, people are stimulated by the music to move faster and will spend less time loitering and shopping. This leads to a shorter spending process in the mall, which naturally means a decrease in the amount of money spent. Restaurants have a similar effect. Cognitive neuroscience researchers in Scotland did an experiment, let two groups of customers at the same time in a restaurant to eat the same food, the only difference is that one group of people listened to slow tempo music, the other group listened to fast tempo music. The only difference was that one group listened to slow tempo music and the other group listened to fast tempo music. The results showed that the customers who listened to slow tempo music spent 14 minutes longer on their meal than those who listened to fast tempo music. Once you understand the relationship between music tempo and consumption time, you can use this to design your own music. If you are the manager of a shopping mall or supermarket, you should naturally try to use slow-paced music to lengthen the consumption time, but if you are a restaurant operator, you should choose fast-paced background music to accelerate the speed of turning tables. Of course, this can not just look at the rhythm of the music. Cognitive research has found that if the volume of the background music during the meal is appropriate and the tune is enjoyable, then the meal will taste better. On the contrary, if you use 80 decibels of white noise, the sense of taste will become dull, customers will feel that the dish is not salty enough or not enough sugar, tasteless. Interestingly, 80 decibels of white noise will make people feel that the food is more crispy. You can think back to how it feels to eat on an airplane. Most people have the feeling that domestic airplane meals are usually not very tasty. But in fact, the suppliers of airplane meals are well aware of the impact of the environment on the palate, so airplane meals are generally very salty and very heavy. The reason for this is simple. In addition to the low humidity inside the aircraft and the effect of cabin pressure on the human body, Unilever's research also found that part of the reason for the bland taste of airplane meals is the dull sound of the engine, which reduces a person's sensitivity to salt, sugar, and other spices, but at the same time makes the food feel more crispy. People are often comfortable with neat or memorable sounds, but they don't realize how powerful sound can be if it is used to drive the consumer experience. If you consider the ratio of cost to benefit, lighting, signage, materials, architecture, the cost of creating these elements is not as cost-effective as examining sound. 
Sound is also the only element that can be adjusted in real time and significantly improve the experience, it can change with the seasons, or reflect a time of day, or a particular moment in time. Most businesses just struggle to fill their spaces with bland sound, not trying to make a difference, but trying not to make a difference. The result is that no one will feel the slightest difference from such a sound. With this example, do you also feel the magic power of sound in the process of consumption? Using sound to tell a brand story, Apple's boot up beep. Of course, the function of sound is not only applicable to music. If you are using an Apple computer, do you remember the first sound you hear when you restart the computer? Normally, this boot up sound is alerting you that the computer is up and running at this time and is booting up. Of course, you may consciously pay attention to this sound every time you start your computer. It is because of this sound that you don't have to stare at the computer screen to know if the computer has responded. Hearing this, you may think that this is probably similar in function to the hitting sound you hear after successfully hitting a monster while playing a game. Indeed, this sound does function as a kind of executive feedback, but it is by no means the only one. Now you think back to how the sound brought you a feeling. Does it sound cool, but at the same time with a fresh, down-to-earth and even reassuring feeling? Does it remind you of other feelings that the Apple brand brings to you? This is a branding sound, hearing it suggests that this is an Apple-branded computer, and this simple boot-up sound is both functional and emotional, and can give you a lot of valuable information in just a few seconds. This sound is called the brand navigation sound. All Apple computers today, whether laptop or desktop, use the same boot-up tone, but it didn't start out this, zen. The man who designed it, Jim Ricks, was a programmer himself, and he spent the first few years of his career at Apple being unmotivated, but he was always privately interested in the use of sound. At the time, Apple's boot-up tone was a set of chords designed by a mathematician, known professionally as triplets. From the point of view of music theory, this set of chords was not harmonious and could be described as very harsh. But this sound has been played over and over again so many times that both people in the company and customers are used to using it, not to mention that everyone agrees that no one will decide whether to buy an Apple computer because your boot-up tone sounds good or not. I don't know if you realize this, the sound of your computer's boot-up actually sets the tone for your experience. It's a symbol of an upcoming experience that Ricks calls the auditory icon, the original English word for auditory icon is earcon, from ear ear and icon icon. The original word is translated as ear signal, but I don't think it's quite right, so I'll translate it here as auditory icon. When I started to design the new auditory icon for Apple, Ricks thought that it should be a refresher for the ear. No matter what mood the user is in when he turns on his computer, the first sound he hears should not bring him anxiety but should have a calming effect. At the same time, it should also be considered that this sound can be applied to all models, and even the worst speakers can show the effect of this sound. In the end, Ricks chose a simple C major chord. This sound is calming, and he added some reverberant stereo effects to it, allowing the sound to fade from back to front and left to right. This stereo effect adds a cool touch to this simple sound. However, after hearing the final effect of the sound, Apple executives were still hesitant to replace the boot tone, and this hesitant reaction was normal. Luckily, Ricks was eventually rewarded by some of the executives and was able to get the boot up tone on the 1991 Apple computer release. As expected, the few seconds of the boot up tone was so well received that one professional reviewer commented, the moment I heard the boot up sound, I knew I was going to experience something great. Since 1991, Apple has insisted on using the same sound for all Apple computers, and has barely modified the sound for nearly 30 years. Like the brand's visual identity, the auditory logo doesn't need to be tweaked very often. Of course, change itself is not a bad thing, but if you want to change it, you must change it for the better. Since then, Apple has paid more attention to sound effects, such as the whoosh, sound when sending an email with an Apple phone, 
which sounds inexplicably satisfying. This is the power of just the right sound. With the two examples above, we understand the impact of sound in our daily lives. Next, we'll learn how to expand that sound impact and make it work better. Let's start by looking at the six principles for maximizing the impact of your voice. For companies that realize the power of sound and seek to get it just right, the key question is not how good that sound is but how to tie the sound to the brand story in a meaningful and authentic way. This process is called voice branding. While a number of companies have taken notice and put sound branding into practice over the past few decades, it's still a very new term for most businesses and media people. Even if you realize the importance of sound and want to find the right sound for your brand, most people are still feeling their way around the issue of how to maximize the impact of sound. In this regard, Joel Beckman, author of Sonic Boom, summarizes six principles. Principle 1, your voice should tell your brand's story. First, your voice should relate to your brand and be able to tell your brand's story. This is something you can associate with human interaction. Think back to a new friend or partner you met recently, do you remember every word and action he said when you first met him? It's hard, isn't it? People will forget what you said and did, but it's hard to forget how you made them feel. If your voice is just a meaningless sound, without any emotion or story, then, no matter how full of content it is, it won't bring a certain feeling to your audience. What story are you trying to tell? Or what feeling do you want to give? This, then, is the first question that requires you to think carefully. Why is this story important, and how does it differ from other stories? Only when this is clear first will you have something to measure the sound you want to design. When you get a sample of the sound, then you have to think, does this sound like mine or someone else's? It's like the national anthem. No matter how inspiring a song is to the people, if it doesn't tell the story of that people, it's hardly going to inspire national pride. Principle 2, just because your audience likes it doesn't mean it's right for your brand. This is a very common mistake. Merchants confuse music that audiences like with sounds that evoke the emotions associated with the brand's story. In other words, just because rap is popular among young people right now, you can't immediately add rap elements to your brand's music. The most important question about sound is always, does it make you feel something? There are now many academic and industry experts who believe that modern technology has made consumers care less and less about the quality of music because people are used to listening to compressed MP3 files. In other words, quality has become a captive of portability. This conclusion first came from a Stanford University music professor, Jonathan Berger. Berger had freshmen in his class listen to the same song in different file formats for six years. Berger found that the students preferred the overcompressed, low quality versions to the highly reproducible high definition formats because they were used to the distorted sound in the compressed files, and to them, that's how the music sounded. This finding has so troubled many manufacturers of high end headphones that some are spending millions of dollars to develop artificial ears for testing headphone comfort, and even tens of millions to create virtually silent anechoic chambers. This pursuit of higher quality business model is not simply wrong. At the same time, expensive Beats headphones have become hot again. Although most music professionals and music enthusiasts think Beats bass is too heavy, Many areas are muddy and hard to hear, but among young consumers, beats again very sought after. This makes the pursuit of professional high-end headphone manufacturers more depressed, is it really because the current young consumers like bass too heavy? In order to detect this, a manufacturer specifically invited teenagers to a special laboratory to do a double-blind test. The test showed that, without knowing the brand, the vast majority of people would not choose Beats as bass-heavy headphones, and even find the Beats sound annoying. What's going on here? Quite simply, the experts all made the same mistake. They all assume that people will make choices based on sound quality. People like Beats because they like the music in their headphones, they like the design, 
they like the fact that we do a lot of things while listening to music, and using beats just fits in with the lifestyle of the moment. In the same way, we don't choose to listen to songs on our phones because we prefer the sound of MP3 format, but because we can put our phones in our pockets and listen to them anytime and anywhere. Principle 3, add some appropriate sound in the background. The third principle has to do with the choice of background music. Sound can be the emotional engine of any story. A film's soundtrack can trigger emotions in the audience, but it's also more than that. Horror filmmakers are masters at using sound to drive emotion. That's why, when you feel like you're being scared by a horror movie, plug your ears. That way, you won't miss the plot that's happening while not being scared. Of course, background music isn't just for movies. The right soundtrack is one that can make you feel relaxed. Background music is a powerful tool for creating a soothing environment, and that's the secret to W Hotels. The next time you visit the W or another boutique hotel, pay attention to the sounds that are there, such as the music playing in the restaurant, by the pool, and in the room where you first checked in. Whether you like the music or not is not so important. Imagine what ambient sounds you might hear if you didn't hear any background music when you first entered your room. Noise from the street downstairs, the rattling of an air conditioning unit in an adjacent building, or the conversation of a couple in the next room. The W Hotel's approach is that there is no way to control ambient sounds all the time, but at least, they are able to drown out or change those sounds. The next time you notice a sound, think briefly about whether you should notice it. Is the sound so abrupt because the volume is too loud? Or because it doesn't fit into a particular story? Is it intentional? Most importantly, does the sound you hear make you feel something at least? Asking these questions can help you become more aware of the ways in which your voice manipulates itself. Principle 4. Make the sound have a clear function and provide information that is conducive to the user experience. This is not an absolute, but if a signal makes sense, people will naturally pay more attention to it. Sounds from all directions can tell us about our environment and provide a lot of information we may not be aware of. For example, if we are walking down the road, even if we are talking to a friend or looking at our phone, we will know that a car is approaching when the sound of an engine suddenly becomes louder, and we will immediately move out of the way. There are many other examples of this, and they carry a variety of messages. In the case of the subway, the New York and London subways make a warning beeping sound before the doors close. This sound was originally intended to warn people to be careful not to get caught in the doors, but subway dispatchers turned it into a strategy to urge passengers on the platform to get on the train quickly by playing the beeping warning sound and pretending to close the doors so that passengers on the platform and at the ticket gates who heard the sound would speed up and catch the train. On the Moscow subway, a male voice is used to indicate a train running clockwise and a female voice to indicate a train running counterclockwise so that passengers can quickly determine if they are on the right direction. In Japan, the train system uses a variety of tunes to indicate the name of the station, so that even if you are resting with your eyes closed or have not listened to the entire tone, you will know if the next stop is your destination. The function of sound can be more complex. For example, a Danish headset company designed a headset specifically for firefighters, which allows firefighters to hear three-dimensional, spatially accurate sound cues, so that in a dense, almost invisible environment of smoke, to know the location of teammates. Such a principle has also been flexibly used by game developers in computer games. The famous shooter, Call of Duty, requires players to use sound to identify the environment and move forward in the game. This is what functional sounds are all about, they give you very clear information that is beneficial to your experience. Principle 5, Say No to Sound Spam. Before designing a sound and finalizing whether or not you want to use that sound, there is one very important aspect that should never be forgotten, and that is, try taking that sound off to see the overall effect. As with Apple's boot up beep before, many times we hear it so much that we get used to it even if it's hard to hear. This is a common blind spot. 
If you don't feel anything at all after removing this sound, it probably means that the sound is not designed well enough, or should not appear at all. In order to avoid this kind of sound garbage and useless work, a very important suggestion is, don't wait until the end of the creative process to start thinking about sound. A common problem with many domestic TV series is that the soundtrack is too loud. Sound effects that have been misplaced or timed inappropriately will drag the audience out of the entire drama, and this kind of soundtrack will not serve a good purpose at all, but will instead become sound garbage. Principle 6. Create silence. Although we talked about the importance of the emotion and function of sound, the more sound is not the better. In addition to avoiding sound garbage, we should also be aware that sometimes a good sound is not as good as no sound at all, that is, no sound is better than a sound at this time. The white space in the voice provides an emotional gap that allows people to prepare for an emotional shift or sublimation. Instead, silence can be more tense than sound. So in creating the desired listening experience, we have to deal not only with the sound itself, but more importantly with the balance between sound and silence. Having said that, most people will probably never really experience what it's like to be silent in their lifetime. We are born without ear caps, which means that hearing operates at all times, and even with the best earplugs or sound-deadening headphones, sound can still be transmitted through the bones. There is basically no place in nature or in the city where absolute silence can be achieved. Where can you experience silence? You have to go to a professional sound deadening room. I work in auditory research, and there are such anechoic chambers in my institute. In the anechoic chamber, you can only hear your own breathing and heartbeat, and you will have the feeling that something around you has been emptied, where you will become the sound itself. But if you want to achieve absolute silence, you also have to go to a special anechoic chamber called the absorbing dark room to experience. That kind of anechoic chamber will swallow all the sound in the space. Any loud noise in your body organs will become very noisy. I've heard that 30 minutes in an absolutely silent environment like that can be mind-numbing. Since the definition of silence is relative and not absolute, what should be the opposite of noise? How do we balance sound and silence? Generally speaking sound experts usually need to spend more time to eliminate meaningless sounds in movies and shopping malls. The most straightforward way to eliminate noise is to remove the source that creates it, or to remove it with very targeted sound deadening instruments. Disneyland, on the other hand, does the opposite. Disneyland Paris and Tokyo are close to airports, so there are occasional low-flying planes overhead, and the noise generated by planes can be considered the number one killer of the park's cheerful atmosphere. Disneyland has a complex array of speakers starting from the parking lot. These loudspeaker arrays will play the ambient sound carefully adjusted by the park designers in the most precise way. The sound will not only echo the theme of the park, take you into the story they set, but also let you adjust the mood, but more importantly, when the sound and the buildings and shuttle crowds of costumed staff into one, you will immediately be in this small world. At this point, the sound will play a surprising scene, that is, disappear. Not only will you not notice the occasional noise coming from the sky, you won't even pay attention to the ambient sounds set up by Disneyland. Because it all blends together just right, you no longer pay too much attention to any of the individual things, but treat the sound as part of the environment. In other words, Disney has created an environment that people subjectively feel is silent, a faked, quiet, that becomes a natural barrier between different venues. Finally, let's look at the personal life lessons that come from these ways of dealing with sound. In fact, this example from Disney not only provides a clever solution for noisy public places, but also provides a reference value for our personal lives. Most of us are accustomed to and accept 24-hour urban noise, with the help of earplugs or sleeping pills to get to sleep. But in fact, many noises can be neutralized by the flexible use of other sounds. When choosing a location, it is common sense to consider the noise near your home, such as not living next to a railroad or highway, and for those who are a little more discerning, 
to study the routes that planes must take off and land in the city. We spend a lot of time studying the color, texture and feel of tiles and flooring, but I have observed that very few people consider how these home designs will sound. In fact, many times, professional architects forget the important role of sound in a space. For example, in the vast majority of cases, the walls are certainly right-angled or parallel, but this can lead to repeated internal sound bouncing, making a perfect noise gathering place in the center of the room. This explains why it is so noisy to have a party in an apartment, and the person sitting in the center of the room can't hear anything. Similarly, when we buy clothes, we are all well aware of the visual effects of fashion, but few of us will listen specifically to the sound the clothes make in the fitting room. Especially when walking and sitting down, because the fabric produces some embarrassing sounds. It is said that the way a person dresses can tell the story of that person, but many people may not notice that the sound of clothes can also convey subtle messages, such as shoes. A person's pace can reveal the person's physical condition, personality, and even the mood of the moment. In addition, often the cheaper the shoe the more likely to make a loud sound, in order to eliminate the cost of materials, the maker of cheap shoes will make the heel hollow, so that the shoe will be very loud. Unless you are deliberately trying to attract everyone's attention, loud shoes usually do not make a good impression. Of course, one sound I never mentioned in today's sharing is the sound of a person talking. This is certainly not because the sound of human speech is not important, quite the contrary, the sound we make is more important than the content of our speech. Of the overall impact of an oral message, 7% is caused by words, 38% by the voice, and 55% by facial expressions. When you wish to persuade someone or prove something, you can use short periods of silence to change your pace at the right point in time, try slowing down your speech at key moments so that your words are heard more clearly, lower the tone of your voice and use a low voice to convey a message of authority. One of the most interesting things about the voice is that you may not feel the impact it has on you at all until you realize how important it is. It's like air, it's everywhere. But if the voice is even slightly dissonant it can seem abrupt. After the abruptness is resolved, it's hard to notice how it affects you again. There are many wonderful things in this book, but the best thing is that after reading it, I think it's not just telling businesses how to tell stories with sound, but it's unintentionally and intentionally conveying to us how to open our ears to the sounds around us and pay attention to the impact those sounds are having. It will teach you to look at your work and life as you take it for granted with a new perspective. As the author says at the beginning of the book, when the right sounds, at the right time, are used consciously to communicate information and emotions, to help you remember and open up new experiences, you will experience what I call sonic boom moments. Well, that's the end of this book, and I'll see you next time.